You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. One of the first English language journalists in Paris covering women's issues, both in France and abroad, that I first connected with online was today's guest, Megan Clement. Her reporting has appeared in The Guardian, Bloomberg, The Sydney Morning Herald, Al Jazeera, The New Humanitarian, and many other publications. She also edits Impact, a bilingual weekly newsletter dispatch by Les Glorieuses, which you may be familiar with if you've read my second book. Impact covers feminist movements and women's rights worldwide. Megan also teaches journalism at the Sorbonne Nouvelle. Given our impending presidential election, the repercussions of the pandemic on women and their advancement, and the ongoing struggle to curb violence against women, it felt like just the right time to discuss it all with Megan. Thanks for listening. Megan, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we get to the serious stuff, because obviously, uh, whenever we're talking about women, typically it's quite serious. Um, I wanted to say that I revisited your 2019 heat wave story that you wrote for The Guardian because it was, I, I remember laughing hysterically when you wrote it uh, because we were still living in our own drench and sweat uh, at the time. And I just almost couldn't believe that that was that long ago, you know, everything but in the before time seems like it existed in a movie rather than in reality. Um, but you, you used to do kind of a variety of, you know, you, you do more than just, you know, women's, uh, initially you got sort of started covering a whole range of topics. So whether it was Paris and environment and policy and, and occasionally a heat wave. Yes, uh, that piece was, um, I don't want to say fun, because I really thought I was going to die throughout most of it. Um, but it, it really was a lesson to me, which is always think about the consequences of your pitches, um, because I pitched it as let, let me try everything uh, that Paris suggests to stay cool on the hottest day in history. Um, and I really should have realized that that was going to involve pictures of me and my swimwear being published in, uh, in The Guardian. Uh, which is not necessarily something I would have jumped into if I'd thought about it. Um, I really went into that piece with a bit of uh, bravado uh, as an Australian thinking, oh, 47 degrees, you call that hot, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I nearly died. It was absolutely awful. Uh, 47 well, degrees plus, is you... terrible everywhere, uh, but it's worse in Paris than anywhere else I've felt it. Oh, no, absolutely. And I remember you, were, you had your dog with you at one point or people were asking, like, but is your dog okay? Because... <laughs> As we know, our pets are kind of sufferers in a different way. Yeah, I mean, my dog was absolutely fine. He was doing much better than me. He was into <laughs> the fan uh, with the shutters closed at home, and I was sort of traipsing the streets uh, at 3 p.m., thinking I might expire at any moment. But, yes, I went for a midnight <laughs> walk with the dog because they, they kept the, the parks open all night. Um, so midnight when it was a little more uh civilized temperature we 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 went out uh, together but yes everyone everybody is always worried about the dog and maybe that's a good segue into our conversation because it seems that everyone is worried about everyone except women uh so <laughs> just to you know kick off on a depressing note um so obviously your you know the core of your work now is uh, involves all aspects of sort of women's rights and and life and progress um and a lot has happened in the last several years. Um if you had to wager a guess do you think that things have improved or regressed for women in France since the start of the pandemic? Oh well it's so hard to say. Um I think uh France has suffered from a lot of the same problems as other countries, um, issues of domestic violence became very acute during the pandemic here as everywhere. Um, and obviously, um, many countries worldwide saw um, regression on women's rights in terms of the amount of care work women were doing, which was already far disproportionate, that increasing. If someone's going to drop out of the workforce in a heterosexual couple, it's usually a woman. Uh, so these are very global issues. Uh, we also have issues in France with people who need abortions. Um, during the confinement, when borders were closed, uh, it would have been and it was difficult for people who needed abortions to travel for those. Um, abortion being uh, legal in France until recently, up until 12 weeks, and now uh, with a new um, 
bill that's passed up to 14. Uh, so that was complicated. Um, so, I mean, but these are, these are global problems uh, that were accentuated by the pandemic. Um, I certainly think that the atmosphere in France for the six years that I've been here has become more and more difficult for Muslim women, in particular women who wear the veil, uh, the kind of discussions that we've had around the loi separatisme here um, and in the presidential election uh, campaign that's happening, uh, the way Muslim women have been weaponized by politicians uh, has gotten worse. Uh, so those things have happened. Um, there is a greater, uh, we have had some pretty incredible movements um, around Me Too in France, a little bit sort of delayed from when they happened in the US, perhaps. Uh, we've also seen Me Too incest, uh, Me Too gay. Uh, there's really been uh, a lot of people coming forward and, and, and some societal change, I think, uh, that's been associated with that. So It's always a mixed bag <laughs> with women's rights. Um, and I think the pandemic has really shown not just um, how in, uh, inequality between men and women has been accentuated in a number of situations, but also, um, you know, how women are intersectionally affected by, um, by these problems uh, and certainly the number of essential workers who are women, uh, the number of essential workers who are women of color. Um, so crossing class, race, ability and disability, um, all of that has been accentuated by the pandemic everywhere that I've been paying attention to. Uh, including Which, and, and, and you pay attention to, a whole a whole lot of places because you know impact the newsletter covers not just what's going on in France but sort of globally what are the main you know main issues um, and actually what I thought was so interesting was in your editor uh, announcement or a little note um, you said that one of the reasons you wanted to edit a, a newsletter like this uh, was because the hardest part of your job is convincing people that stories about women in politics are worth running. Too often, this is you writing, I have proposed a story about, say, femicide or abortion rights to an editor, inevitably a male one, only to be told we have something on a similar topic running this month. Apparently, women only matter once a month, in addition to a variety of other excuses that one could give as to why, you know, you can't run a story about women. So how likely, I'm just wondering, because obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're embarking on building up this newsletter and hopefully can, you know, make it a reference um, that will draw people in from other outlets or who would ordinarily read other out outlets, how likely do you think, um, or I mean, the goal I'm assuming would be to try to get some of those readers who, um, you know, are more likely to read, you know, an article on feminism or fe women's rights if they see it in The Guardian or The New York Times. So what is this, how, how are you approaching this to try to like, you know, Obviously, you're, you're creating your own platform or you're, you're going to your, you know, a platform that you manage to be able to tell these stories. But we need the eyeballs, too, on stories like those. So how do you approach this sort of a, a dynamic? With difficulty, um, <laughs> I think uh, as journalists um, in 2022, we're very much expected to be able to promote and to Uh, bring an audience to the work that we do. It's just part of the job now. It's not a part of the job that I've ever found easy. Uh, the lazy answer would be to tell you that I hope the work speaks for itself and attracts readers on its own. Uh, but I think, uh, no, there is a large amount of work to do. Um, one of the things that I think is very strong about our impact project is that it is bilingual. Um, and that's very important to me as, as a bilingual person. Uh, but also, I think often the worlds of French feminism and um, Anglophone feminism, let's say, uh, are not speaking to each other enough. Uh, and I would love to kind of uh, create more of a dialogue uh, in, that, in that space. Um, I'm, you know, we have various partnership plans, which I don't know if they're particularly interesting to listeners of your podcast, but uh, definitely trying to enter into partnerships with other newsletters. There's so many fantastic uh, feminist newsletters mm. that are out there now in French and in English. And I think that's something that's been a great development of recent years that we've seen um, with the rise of newsletter journalism uh, that allows us to create spaces that, as you say, are often not made available in the mainstream media. Um, 
So hopefully with some cross promotion and really with me, um, you know, I'm, I'm primarily obviously Anglophone. I write in English, I edit in English, uh, and then we work in translation for the French side of things. So yes, my, my priority is to build up our English uh, readership. Uh, we currently have twice the number of readers in French than we have in English, which is great. Um, but I'd love for more Anglophone readers to, to come and find our content. I think Les Glorieuses is quite, um, um, is a unique proposition uh, in media. And, and I think um, reaching more of an English language audience can only be a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of times I know that the people who have followed my, you know, my work interviewing, you know, various French individuals are kind of always hungry to know whether that exists in English or whether that person's, you know, book, film, whatever is available in English. And so, you know, given that these topics are so important to me too, I'm glad to be able to push people to read <laughs> the in-depth reporting over over on impact. Um, we're obviously approaching the end of Macron's term. Uh, and you mentioned that, that earlier. We, you know, he's had quite a number of crises uh, to fight since he took office, surely most of which he wasn't expecting. Um, but I'm not so sure he worked very hard to fight the one he promised to make the priority of his presidency, which was gender equality, women's rights, and health. Um, New Tout, which is a, you know, a feminist organization, which I know, I'm sure you know, reported that 220,000 women are victims of violence each year in France. Uh, but the measures established to address this reality were largely insufficient, both you know, in scale and budget. What do you make of his public objectives and the results of the administration? And is it really likely that any of the, you know, other candidates could, you know, could do better? I mean, if we're going to assume that maybe, well, I won't assume anything yet. Let's just start there. Yeah, I mean, I was actually with Nutut and a bunch of feminist organizations when the response to the Grenelle, uh, I guess, public inquiry into um, conjugal violence was announced in 2019. Uh, and it was received with boos, <laughs> basically. Uh, that's people booing, not alcohol. Um, because no additional um, money was allocated. Uh, it was sort of shuffling things around. And I think it has been characteristic of the Macron um, government to make big announcements around things like women's rights, but not actually put their money where their mouth is. I think that's fair to say. Um, we have seen, as I mentioned, some advances in women's rights. Um, I do agree with Nutut that the measures announced to deal with uh, violence against women, um, intimate partner violence, in this country are not sufficient. Uh, and I know that many feminist groups feel that way. Um, would anyone else do a better job? I mean, I think um, I so sort of mentioned this earlier, but this sort of, uh, there's been a lurch to the right in France um, over the past five years. Um, and the presidential campaign is being fought on the right. Uh, so I don't imagine that there is a better option with the other candidates. Um, and I think with the war in Ukraine, it's looking like it's a done deal uh, for Macron. So to say the least, yeah. I mean, to uh, give him his due, he is, he seems interested in women's rights. Uh, and he often says the right things about women's rights. I hope uh, in the next um, we see some more money, uh, which is what what is basically needed. Um, and he has said he would like a female prime minister. He hasn't managed one yet. He's had two goes, uh, hasn't quite managed one. Uh, so maybe maybe in the next five years, we'll see that. Well, yeah. And also, I know that uh, wasn't there some, maybe I'm imagining this because, you know, who knows with, with COVID, I mostly go in and out of hallucinations. Uh, wasn't there... Um, some budget allocated to specifically toward conjugal violence during the pandemic. I remember Marne and Shepa being on television trying to, uh, you know, basically defend some of the decisions that the administration was making, um, you know, and, and whatever they were devoting to. I don't know if it was police or training or what they were trying to devote money to, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, it was just sort of like, here, let's just pull out a number from our hat and hopefully that will be enough for people. But of course, it was not. 
I think the means that are allocated to this problem are, are just so below what would be required. And also the, the problem, one of the big problems we have with intimate partner violence in this country is the response of the police. Um, there have been two cases this year that have really um, thrown light on that. I mean, the absolutely horrific case of Chinese Daud. Uh, who was murdered by her husband who had already gone to jail for um, violence against her, uh, who assaulted her on his release from prison. Uh, she was not notified of this uh, when she went to the police about the assault. Uh, just a series of... I, it, they, I, you don't even want to call them errors because they had mortal consequences, um, but a, a series of... Um, disregard uh, from the police left this woman at the mercy of her violent ex-partner um, and she was killed in a horrific fashion near her near her home. Uh, and we've also seen the revelations of Mediapart uh, of a woman who went to report being assaulted to the police and was called, I mean, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast, but uh, she, was, <laughs> um, she was the subject of immense sexist insults uh, by the police officers in question. Uh, so it's a lottery in France about where uh, where you are uh, will often dictate how you will be responded to as a victim of violence. Um, and very often the police are the problem. Um, so, yes, some formation uh, would be good. Uh, but we, what we have is a, a real fundamental um, lack of trust understandable lack of trust between many women and the police and a lack of regard for the seriousness of sexual violence and intimate partner violence on the, well, on the part of the police. And, and, and also, isn't this sort of like, I mean, if you really want to tackle issues like this and all countries need to be, you know, combating toxic masculinity and and, and the way that we raise boys, uh, the way that we even raise women to perceive the role of boys in in families and this sort of thing. I mean, ultimately, like, it's such a multi-pronged issue. Uh, but certainly in France, it does seem like <laughs> there are so many directions this needs to go to, to, to see improvement. Um, and I know that Nutut was um, posting about the number of femicides already in the beginning of 2022. You know, in the first month, I think there were like, I don't know, 15, and, and the government said very little. Um, and, and this was at a time before the crisis in Ukraine, when they probably had a little bit more uh, bandwidth to make statements about this. Um, but well, anyway, were, I mean, it's sort of... There were three in the first days of 2022. I mean, geez, um, I mean, good God. And there was very little response to that. Very, very little response. So, I mean, what is the point of having, you know, uh, these roles uh, in, in within the government on parity and women's issues? I mean, it's it's like posturing at that point. Um, is it posturing? I, I'm not sure. Um, it's certainly, I think, the idea that women's rights has been a grand cause uh, of this cancana, uh, I think that would be stretching it a little bit, uh, to be honest. <laughs> No, I think COVID was his grand cause malgré lui. You know, like he didn't, I mean, he didn't expect that, of course. But, you know, even before COVID, before the Gilets jaunes or simultaneously with the Gilets jaunes, I mean, there can't just be one issue that, you know, a president is able to tackle. Unfortunately, like he kind of needs to be a multitasker. Yes. And I definitely think more could have been done and more more means, really. Um, I, I keep saying more money, but that's that's exactly uh, what the pro pro problem needs. Um, I think what you said about education is very important. I was working on um, a piece on femicide in 2019, and I was speaking to a woman whose sister was killed by her partner. Uh, and I spoke to a range of families and sometimes it was a situation like the one I just mentioned with Chinese Dawood where it was, was, I mean, a long history of abuse um, and, and the families just desperate to get their loved one out of the situation. Um, the woman I was speaking with that I'm mentioning um, was the opposite. It came out of nowhere. Um, it, it was, they had, they had no idea. Uh, and I asked her what would have saved your sister, Yiren. Uh, and she said, education is the only thing that would have helped. 
because often it is a case that a woman has been to the police multiple times to um, make a complaint about a violent partner. That wasn't the case in this in, in this instance. And she said only if um, the her partner had been better educated <laughs> at school, you know, when these when these attitudes formed, that's that's what would have saved her, and that's what this woman is is campaigning for now. Um, mm. along with a suite of other measures. So I, I really think um, it's a very, un, in, in some ways, it's a very unsatisfactory um, response to intimate partner violence because it does not help people now. Um, no. You're helping, you're, helping, uh, you're helping victims of violence in 20, 30 years um, by intervening in school, but it really is the, uh, one of the major, major things that needs to be done urgently, as well as sorting out the police response to this and not just having you know, a couple of good centres around the country where they're really good at um, receiving women who've been victims of violence, but absolute root and branch reform of the police, uh, which, again, France has no exception to many other countries that need to look at this. So how does France then compare broadly to other EU countries? Because you regularly cover and report about you know, uh, various policies throughout the EU. Obviously, we know that uh, Spain and the Netherlands have been far ahead of France in terms of um, IVF access uh, to to lesbian women and uh, single women. Um, you know, obviously, the law has finally changed, but it's going to take a while for that to actually, you know, be put into practice. Um, so, you know, what what are some other countries doing differently that you think maybe have also been successful? Well, Spain really is the leader in terms of responding to femicide. And Spain had absolutely atrocious laws on, on, on violence against women until very recently. Um, this was most obviously seen in the Wolfpack case, where, um, and this is something we see in France, uh, where you need to have a certain element of surprise or violence in order for something to be, to be classified as rape. Um, so Spain has really changed um, its approach to this in a very admirable fashion. And I think that France is looking to Spain um, and taking on some of the same policies uh, a few years behind. Uh, one thing that I talk about ad nauseum in Europe is access to abortion. Um, France very recently um, increased the time limit for abortion from 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, this is good. Another two weeks is good. It is far from sufficient. Uh, and we only need to look at Colombia, uh, which has just overnight made abortion available up to on demand up to 24 weeks to see that uh, we can do better. <laughs> um, and that's uh, the UK, it's 24 weeks. Uh, there are problems with provision there, which don't get me started. Uh, but in the Netherlands, it's 22, uh, 14. It's pretty low. Uh, so France can do better on abortion, but the entire EU uh, really is very complacent on abortion. Uh, hmm. We allow Malta to have a total ban on abortion. Uh, one of the stories I reported during the pandemic was that um, when Malta closed its borders uh, due to COVID-19, people were literally trapped on an island with zero access to abortion, uh, which should never happen um, and the EU absolutely prides itself on being a bastion of human rights. Um, just shouldn't happen somewhere like that. Uh, Poland, the situation is terrible. Um, there, they three women have died since they changed their abortion law to make it even tighter. It's it's not a total ban, but it's very close to being a total ban. Um, where do you go from Poland if you want an abortion? Usually Germany, um, where the, uh, you needed until recently mandatory counselling. In order to have an abortion, uh, the new government there has said it will change that. Um, so the cheapest place to go from Poland if you needed an abortion was Ukraine. Um, so, I mean, this is something that I think, and I haven't even got to the fact that the new president of the EU parliament is a Maltese MEP who is anti-abortion. Um, right, right. So... The EU needs to do better on abortion. Um, and I think, you know, when we look at places like the US uh, and the fact that Roe v. Wade is in the balance and states like Texas um, having bringing in absolutely inhumane laws on abortion, uh, that is one thing. But I think in the EU, EU, we often look at that from a place of complacency when really the right 
to abortion in this continent uh, and in this block is far from secure and nowhere near as good as it should be. My God. It just seems like, you know, for every step forward, you know, you've got five steps back and certainly COVID. I mean, going back to my first question, which was, you know, like, how has France fared during COVID? I mean, obviously what you just described is an additional barrier to what already exists. You can't even, there's no movement. We couldn't go anywhere. Um, and then you just start thinking about the women who are trapped in situations or raped and have no recourse. Um, and obviously there are foundations that exist, but, you know, getting to them in times of crisis, especially during COVID was like trying to, you know, escape from a hole you had fallen into with no one around. I mean... Well, this is something where abortion and intimate partner violence have something in common, which is if you have a violent partner and you are stuck at home with them because of uh, a lockdown order, you not only are stuck in in a dangerous situation, but it's almost impossible to get help because the, one of the things that people need in fleeing those situations or in resolving those situations is privacy. Um, you can't even make the call to women on web to order your um, abortion medication because your partner might overhear. You can't make a call to a domestic violence helpline because your partner might overhear. And that's something that we definitely saw all over uh, the world. I mean, on medical abortion, uh, this is another realm in which France could do much better. Uh, they extended the um, the deadline for u- using uh, medical abortion by two weeks, another extension by two weeks during the pandemic to account for the fact that... Um, uh, to account for the fact that the pandemic was having a, having an effect, but I mean they should have extended it permanently to the WHO standard, which is twelve weeks. Uh, mm. You know, five seven weeks. This is not enough time for many people to know they're pregnant. Uh, and these are things that could be done and are not done. And I would want a country like France, which has traditionally been a leader on abortion in Europe, um, to do better on. Now, the question is sort of like, why has France been so slow in some regards or have trouble to rally the votes for some of these bills? Because they're kind of, yes, they're Catholic on paper, but, you know, they're far less religious overall as a country than Spain, for example, who is far more progressive on all of these issues. What do you think is going on here? Oh, I think uh, I think we're supposed to be secular on paper, isn't that the, <laughs> the case here? Right. <laughs> also, yes, yes, yes. We just don't even get me started. I, right. you know, I think things are really changing in terms of the hold that religion has over the right to choice. Uh, Colombia, uh, again, I bring it up again because it's a uh, it traditionally a very Catholic religious country. Uh, Ireland, absolute absolute tsunami of change there in in terms of women's rights uh and specifically in legalizing um abortion recently uh so i don't even know if if we can look to catholicism or a country's history of catholicism as being indicative of uh abortion rights as much anymore uh and that's inevitably a good thing um, mm. I don't know why France uh, isn't better. It's it's not terrible. It's not the worst country in the U- EU, uh, but I think it could be a leader, and I don't really know why it's not, to be honest. I wish I had yeah. a good answer yeah. for you. Well, maybe because there's been such an emphasis on business and being the leader in business <laughs> and tech. I don't know. I guess he could only put his attention truly to, to, to one area. To, um, to discounts I'm, on your tax. Being, right. I'm just being nasty <laughs> now. Um Okay, so back to impact, because I want to I want to close out with some, you know, background on that. So, you know, I just got it's a Monday newsletter that people will receive in their inboxes. It's free to sign up, I'm assuming, to get the the newsletter. And and what I noticed this morning was that it was full of uh, information from all over the world. Um, how do you go about then choosing what you're going to cover? Like, what is the, what can people expect also moving forward? Sure. So we have four uh, types of content that we put out. Um, there's an editor's note at the start of the month, uh, which is by and large written by me. Uh, what you see today was our news wrap, uh, which is sort of, um, as it suggests, a wrap of everything that made news in the realm of women's rights uh, and feminism. And that's written by my colleague, Christina Odoki. Um, then we have an interview every month uh, with a feminist leader, thinker, activist, 
uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and the one coming up this month is from one of the architects of the abortion victory in Colombia. Uh, and then there's in the feature, which is sort of the flagship, and it's a piece of investigative or um, in-depth uh, reportage um, from as many countries in the world as I can possibly arrange. Uh, so it's going to be Ukraine this month. So uh, you can see from that um, kind of overview that we are driven by the news. Uh, I often feel like feminist developments like, for example, this victory in Colombia are covered when it happens um, in a brief news story and then everybody moves on. Uh, whereas I have questions like, okay, how did you do that? How did you go from a total abortion ban in 2005 to one of the most progressive laws in the world in 2022. You know, I really want to go in depth on these issues, uh, which I think are quite covered on a surface level often uh, by the mainstream media. And far be it from me to criticize, there's a lot going on at the moment. Um, hang on. <coughs> I have to cough. <laughs> um, You're loud. <laughs> So we are news driven. Um, I'm also interested. I just want to hear about and I want to tell people about grassroots feminist movements worldwide that are uh, achieving change. I have covered women's rights for more than a decade now, and it's very easy to fall into the trap of being very, I suppose, Western NGO led. Um, look at this brilliant um, Brussels-based NGO. We gave some women some chickens and now they are financially independent. Um, you know, these kind of slightly paternalistic, all this talk of empowering women. Um, the thing about the word empowerment is it's supposed to be something you do to yourself. Uh, and that's how it was traditionally used by feminist thinkers in the 20th century. And it's been turned into something that benevolent organizations do to other people. So I definitely don't want to do any coverage like that. And I'm very interested in hearing uh, about women who are making change um, themselves um, and who are uh, pushing for broader rights, I suppose. So I really trying to find out, and this is a this is something that's uh, difficult to do and it's a lot of work on my part and I have much to do, but to find out who is doing that work where and sort of highlight it. Um, so that's kind of the the ethos. It's I have the whole world mm -hmm. to cover. Uh, so that's a lot of women, um, but uh, it's a wonderful... You have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. And also, so can, can for, for listeners who are wondering, well, how much will I get to learn about what's happening in France, will that still come up from time to time in English? It will come up from time to time. Um, you know, we're part of Les Glorieuses. There are two other newsletters that very much cover France, Les Petits Glos and Les Glorieuses. Uh, so uh, we will cover France in as much that it's uh, a country in the world. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I'm sure we'll have a few things to say about the election um, next month. Absolutely, um, yeah. But I hope... You know, one thing I think is important is, you know, why not subscribe to both the English and the French one and to, and to, and to see how we talk about women in these two languages. Um, That's a very good point and a very good idea. Yeah, I have I have heard from more than one person that they use it to practice learning French and I, I can only endorse that approach. <laughs> well, certainly, if you're interested in certain themes, whether that's food or women's rights or whatever, um, and you're and you're also learning French, I mean, that can only be a helpful resource. Um, well, it helps you know, so to if... read about things that you care about instead of... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, That's the best way to learn. Yeah. And if just as a, as a final note, if people, you know, who are living here, who want to get involved in sort of a hands-on way, are there organizations that you recommend that, you know, accept volunteers or, or is potentially just good to support uh, I would like everyone to, to volunteer race. for abortion hotlines uh, is probably my greatest recommendation, uh, particularly if you are in Europe. Uh, there are organizations um, that will help people in countries with bad abortion laws get to countries with good abortion laws or help them get the abortion medication that they need. Uh, so I am thinking of Women on Web. They do fantastic work. I am thinking of the Abortion Support Network. Um, but just look into it where you are. There are incredible networks of volunteers. There's people in Germany who give up their spare rooms for people in Poland who need to travel to Germany for abortions. 
Um, so that that is something that if you want to do something to help feminist causes is a great thing to do is just help people get abortions. And if you can't volunteer, you can just give money, you can pay for people's abortions, which for me is one of the greatest acts of feminist solidarity that you can undertake. So if you, I mean, you did ask me to evangelize, so that would be my suggestion. Yes, oh, I did, I, I asked for this, absolutely. <laughs> um, Megan, thank you so much. Impact is fantastic already, and I hope everyone will sign up and get that knowledge into their inbox every Monday. Uh, Megan, I hope you'll come back and update us, perhaps during the election or just after. Yes, I'd love to come back, thank you so much. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.